following days, I will be taking a closer look at these intersections with Council Member Ku and other elected officials from Queens and the administration to understand the causes of this crash and prevent this from happening in Queens and other boroughs. Today, we are considering five important pieces of legislation that seek to address common complaints and issues which arise regarding our streets and sidewalks. As elected officials, we know that one of the most common complaints we hear from our constituency has to do with the condition of our, of our roadways and the complicated relationship between the city and the individual property owners when it comes to maintaining our streets and sidewalks. And sometimes the best ideas for legislation designed to fix a common problems come from, very, from these very interactions with our constituencies. These bills are a great examples of that. Intro 231 introduced by Council Member Vaca seeks to solve a common problems of lack of communication between city agencies when it comes to the timing of a street, a street tree planting and how that affects homeowners responsibility to fixing and repairing the sidewalks adjacent to their property. Intro 623 introduced by Council Member Gentile seeks to eliminate uncertainty among drivers and make it clear exactly where parking is provided, prohibited at fire hydrants and bus stops by requiring that the curbs at those locations be painted red. Intro 955 introduced by Council Member Garanik will raise the fines associated with shorted work on the part of the contractors who open our city streets. Too often, soppy, sloppy work leaves the road we, are rely, we all rely on in unacceptable condition and contractors need to be held responsible in order to make sure the job is done right. Intro 1251 by council member myself will require DOT to address ponding on the street, which can be a public health hazard. Lastly, intro 1457 introduced by council member Lanzman seeks to require DOT to maintain curb height following the street construction in order to prevent water from collecting on homeowner's property. While these bills address different issues, they all seek to advance the principles that the city needs to hold both itself and contractors who perform work on our roadways to the same high standards expected of property owners. Of property owner. The city does not hesitate to take enforcement action against homeowners if, for example, the sidewalk in front of their house has a defect or if there is a standing water in the property. Therefore, it is only fair that the city makes sure that its own action do not end up undoing, undoing costly sidewalk repairs or results in water conditions on homeowners' property. Furthermore, the city needs to make sure that drivers have a clear understanding of where they can park and that roads are not left in poor condition, especially after contractors complete street work. Fairness is the bottom line, and I look forward to working together with the administration and the sponsors of these legislations to see how the ultimate goal can be achieved in all of these various cases. It, I also would like to recognize Council Member Carlos Menchaca, who is also with us today, uh, Council Member Van Bremen, who also was here. Uh, when the sponsor of the bill passed by, they will have the opportunity to say a few words. But now I would like to thank those members of administration who are here with us today for being here to provide the input on these bills. I now ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite you to deliver your testimony. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. 
You may proceed. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Margaret Forgione, Chief Operations Officer at DOT. I am joined today by Galileo Orlando, Deputy Commissioner for Roadway Repair and Maintenance, and Leon Hayward, Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalk and Inspection Management. Thank you for inviting us here today on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg and Mayor de Blasio to discuss this set of bills dealing with a variety of issues related to the construction and maintenance of our streets. I am also joined by Sorin Parikh, DEP Chief of Operations for Queens and the Bronx, and Fiona Watt, Senior Advisor to the Assistant Commissioner for Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources at the Parks Department. There are nearly 6,000 miles of streets in New York City. City streets facilitate the movement of pedestrians, transit riders, motorists, and cyclists, as well as the delivery of goods and services throughout the city. Under the surface, these same streets support the city's water, sewer, power, and telecommunications infrastructure, as well as its subway tunnels and building vaults. The streets themselves also serve as public spaces, fostering social, economic, and recreational activities. Our streets are three-dimensional three structures. They include both the underground infrastructure and the sub-base of the street, or in other cases, bridge structures or elevated highways and the surface of the roadway, curb, and sidewalk, as well as features such as pedestrian ramps, driveways, tree pits, and catch basins. The width and shape, as well as the elevation and contour or pitch of the different components must all be thought of in relationship to each other. For example, curbs are typically up to 18 inches in total height, but we just see the amount that is exposed above the surface. The relationship between the elevation and pitch of the road and the height of the curb produces the amount of effective curb height, also called curb reveal, the subject of intro 1251. From cobblestones to brand new asphalt, concrete subbase, and sidewalks and curbs of various types and conditions, our street network varies greatly. Our streets as they exist today are the sum of a long and varied history of construction, acquisition, and maintenance. Once a street is built, it continues to change. Excavations are made and then restored. Streets are milled and paved. Elements such as curbs or sidewalks can be damaged or subside and may be replaced. Wear and tear occurs and eventually, even with maintenance, streets can reach the end of their useful life and need costly and disruptive reconstruction that includes the road base as well as curbs and sidewalks. Under this administration, DOT has made record investment in our streets and dramatically increased both our resurfacing and reconstruction work. We resurfaced 1,325 lane miles in fiscal 17, and we plan to continue that pace by paving another 1,300 lane miles in fiscal 18. Under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, from fiscal 16 to 19, we will pave more than 25% of all city streets. I am happy to report that all these newly paved streets contributed to a dramatic decrease in the number of potholes that DOT has had to fill. Year to date, DOT has had to fill 54% fewer potholes compared to 2014. And under Mayor de Blasio, we have nearly doubled our investment in street reconstruction, taking the amount from 1.7 billion in the last 10-year capital plan in the prior administration to 3.3 billion in the current 10-year plan. As a result, DOT is rebuilding major corridors better and safer than before, such as the Grand Concourse, Queens Boulevard, and Atlantic Avenue, delivering new, great streets for New Yorkers. As part of its mission, DOT works with many stakeholders. DEP is a major excavator in order to access and maintain their infrastructure. Similarly, the utility companies are responsible for a significant portion of street excavations and restorations by necessity in order to install and maintain their infrastructure. Adjoining property owners also have certain responsibilities and play a significant role. Our capital construction projects are executed by DDC and DEP is responsible for the location, construction, and maintenance of catch basins and storm sewers, a crucial component for drainage of our streets. And when it comes to parking regulations and traffic rules, NYPD is responsible for enforcement. Now, with that background in mind, I would like to comment specifically on each of the bills before the committee today. Intro 231 would require the Parks Department to notify DOT of the locations of upcoming tree plantings. 
Likewise, DOT would be required to inform applicants for sidewalk construction permits at those locations of scheduled tree plantings to the extent that we have received such information. On behalf of my Parks Department colleagues, I'm happy to report that pursuant to Local Law 65 of 2017, championed by Councilmember Matteo Levine and others, the Parks Department will begin to make information on all of their scheduled tree pruning, tree stump removal, and tree planting work available to the public online. Parks Forestry Work Tracker is expected, expected to launch on October 23rd. DOT would be happy to explore including a notice to all sidewalk construction applicants as part of our application process, advising them to consult Parks Forestry Work Tracker website prior to scheduling their own sidewalk construction work or pulling permits. Thanks to the availability of the park's new tracker, we believe this would be the simplest and most effective way to accomplish the goals of the proposed legislation. By making all sidewalk construction permit applicants aware of the tracker, it will allow them to see for themselves all of the information available from the Parks Department that might apply to their location, check back for updates, and plan accordingly. Intro 623. Intro 623 would require DOT to paint curbs red in all bus stops and the distance on either side of a fire hydrant from which parking, standing, or stopping is prohibited, which is 15 feet. Maintaining hydrant access for FDNY and facilitating the efficient movement of buses for our city's many bus riders, respectively, are both very high priorities on our streets, hence the importance of both of these regulations. DOT understands that the intent of the bill is to make life easier for drivers trying to figure out where they may or may not park. However, DOT strongly opposes curb painting as a solution. We believe that the focus of our street marking efforts should be on the safety and operability of the street, and that for many reasons, parking regulation of the curb is best indicated with the use of only signage and rules. With millions of feet of curb to regulate, a combination of signage and rules is the most accurate, effective, and cost-efficient method to inform drivers where they are allowed to park. Use of painted curbs is easily susceptible to unauthorized tampering by property owners with their own agenda. Bus stops are also relocated due to construction and service changes. In these cases, signs are easier to move than stripping curbs of paint. Finally, plowed snow can interfere with the visibility of our curb markings, which is certainly a consideration in a city such as ours. For these reasons and others, DOT currently does not paint curbs for any purpose, and doing so would require a new operational unit and an entirely new set of standards. Complying with the requirements of the bill would have a cost of several million dollars for installation and reoccurring maintenance costs of over one million dollars annually. There are approximately 110,000 hydrants citywide. At 15 feet on each side, DOT would be required to paint nearly 3.3 million linear feet of curb. And there are approximately 16,000 bus stops citywide. At an average length of 100 feet, DOT would be required to paint a total of 1.6 million linear feet. All told, this constitutes over 900 miles of curb, in other words, about the distance from here to Cleveland and back. This considerable diversion of resources for street painting operations would detract from our two vital Vision Zero priorities, creating new markings for safety projects and redesigns, and refreshing our existing markings. This could impair our ability to make progress on eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries. For all of these reasons, DOT opposes Intro 623. Intro 955. Intro 955 would raise the maximum amounts in DOT's penalty schedule. The bill itself would not increase the amounts of any of DOT's fines, but rather the range within which DOT is permitted by law to set fines for specific violations by rule. DOT's goal when it comes to regulating and enforcing various uses of our streets is to achieve the greatest compliance levels possible and to protect the city's investment in our vital infrastructure while ensuring safety and minimizing the disruption, congestion, and quality of life effects of street work. In the case of excavations and restorations, in addition to potential fines, permittees face the prospect of required corrective actions or costly redigs of defective restorations, so they have a strong incentive to do the job right the first time. DOT carefully chooses fine amounts in order to provide a deterrent, but also does not want fines to be exorbitant or potentially simply go unpaid. 
Currently, all of DOT's fines are below the maximum permitted amount, and we are not currently seeing a need for any fine amounts in excess of these amounts. However, higher caps would provide greater flexibility and could facilitate the use of a greater range of amounts with higher fines for chronic offenders. DOT seeks to foster coordination and cooperation with the stakeholders who excavate and perform restorations in our streets. Fines and adjustments to the amount of fines are also a component of our toolbox. Therefore, DOT supports the bill in principle to provide greater flexibility. Intro 1251. Now turning to Intro 1251, which requires DOT to verify a ponding problem within 14 days and repair the condition within 60 days of verification. When DOT receives a complaint or becomes aware of a possible ponding issue, our roadways division will conduct an assessment. The first step is to verify the ponding condition, which is done by conducting an observation 48 hours after a significant rain event. Therefore, a requirement of a two-week verification period of a ponding issue would be unworkable because verification is weather dependent and inspection resources are finite. Once the condition is verified, we assess whether the defect can be addressed operationally with milling and paving using topographical analysis in some cases. If the condition can be solved with operational measures, then the location is prioritized and repairs are conducted as resources permit. However, rectifying many of our ponding conditions requires more complicated work that entails a capital construction project. Such projects include the reconfiguration of street and sewer infrastructure. These locations are added to our priorities for inclusion in capital projects. Bergen Avenue between Avenues T and U in the Bill Sponsors District is an example of a location with ponding issues which requires capital work to repair. As announced last fall, we hope to address this condition through inclusion in our Bergen Avenue area capital project, thanks to funding by Mayor de Blasio, and are looking to begin bidding the work out for construction soon. A requirement to repair a ponding condition within 60 days is unworkable. For ponding issues that can be addressed operationally, once assessment and analysis have been completed, our milling and paving operations are deployed on a scheduled and prioritized basis, and may not be immediately available. Milling and paving operations are also dependent on weather and season. For ponding issues in need of a capital project, scoping and project delivery for this type of street reconstruction project would greatly exceed the 60-day requirement because of the study, design, and construction demands involved. For these reasons, DOT opposes Intro 1251. Finally, Intro 1457 relates to maintaining appropriate curb height or reveal. Good curb reveal is important both to ensure proper street drainage and to deter vehicles from mounting the sidewalk. At least three to four inches is usually preferred and our standard for new construction is seven inches. In addition, the curb should be flush with the sidewalk to prevent a tripping hazard. Conversely, at pedestrian ramps and driveways, the goal is to maintain zero curb reveal. This is particularly important at pedestrian ramps for accessibility purposes. Whenever we reconstruct streets in which we typically rebuild the roadbed as well as the surface of the road, the curbs, the sidewalks, and all the features of the street, we build the curb reveal that meets our standards. We also require privately built streets that we will one day take into our ownership to be built to our standards as well. When it comes to street resurfacing, our crews aim to match the current elevation and contours of the roadway as close as possible. Our goal is to meet the existing pedestrian ramps and driveways, stay flush with existing utility manhole covers, and maintain good drainage based upon the location and elevation of existing catch basins while preserving existing curb reveal. And on some streets, curb heights and construction can vary within a single block from property to property. We must balance all of these factors. For example, if we change of the, the pitch of the road to increase curb reveal, we risk creating a depression that is not drained by existing catch basins. As you know, DOT has been ambitiously resurfacing records le record levels of lane miles, but our crews must work with the other elements of the street as they exist, and resurfacing is not able to address every underlying defect or condition a street may have. This bill would potentially require DOT to conduct curb repair or replacement work in conjunction with our resurfacing work 
on any streets where the curb or a small section of the curb may be deficient. And raising a curb can require work on the adjacent sidewalk, possibly including conditions that property owners may be required to correct, which in turn could mean a violation and cost to the property owner. Funding for curb repair, usually done through contracts, is limited. Coordinating contract schedules with our own crew schedules could be very challenging, and the concrete work involved in curb repair is a different process than resurfacing. The requirement to conduct curb work in conjunction with our resurfacing work would cripple the ambitious pace of resurfacing that DOT has been maintaining and leave some streets unresurfaced as a result. Moreover, moreover, as drafted, this bill would require DOT to fix insufficient curb reveal when doing repair of any kind to any part of the roadway or to the sidewalk on a street, whether it touched the curb at all, further hamstringing our operations. For these reasons, DOT opposes intro, intro 1457. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee on these bills before you today. The ongoing management of our vital street network is a major task for New York City and one in which we know the public and many elected officials have a great deal of interest. DOT is always striving to provide New Yorkers the best quality streets possible and we look forward to continuing to work collaboratively with the council to achieve that goal. We are now happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Commissioner. Before I ask a question, I'd like to recognize Councilman, myself, and Baca, both of them also has some of those bills that we are discussing today. I would like to ask them for, to give them the opportunity, Councilmember Uh Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for your testimony. Um, one of the biggest problems uh, in terms of quality of life issues that uh, members of the council uh, have to deal with. Uh, in addition, uh, when I was in the assembly, we had the same problems. The districts are not all, you know, um, um, all together the same, is ponding. Ponding, of course, is a vexatious issue if you happen to live in a house where there's water accumulating for uh, every time it rains in the winter. Um, it's um, sometimes the water becomes fetid and uh, uh, there is uh, ice that's created in the winter. It just, people can't sell their homes because they have uh, serious ponding problems. And the purpose of this bill basically is to push the DOT in the direction of getting these things done. Now, I, I recognize that some of the problems are complicated. Sometimes you have to do uh, entire street reconstructions. But more often than not, uh, all the city needs to do is come in with a little asphalt and even things out. For example, you mentioned uh, Bergen, the Avenue T. Um, I've been there 10 times already with members of the Brooklyn uh, Commissioner's Office. A layer of asphalt, that's all you need. Man who happens to live in the house on the corner um, has been living this with this for 10 years. It's not reasonable. And at the same time, uh, the, uh, the city, in the guise of the Department of Health, will give violations to homeowners who may have some water in their swimming pool. Uh, maybe the, co the cover of their swimming pool is covered with water. I've had a constituent got a fine for $1,000 because there was a, a, a small layer of water. And yet, thousands of streets throughout the city are covered with water. It's not fair, it's not reasonable. The DOT needs to do more to address these problems without reconstructing the entire road work. And the purpose of this bill basically is to put the city on notice that you have to do better. And uh, this is uh, probably, uh, every one of my colleagues could probably say that they have these kinds of situations uh, in their districts. You don't have to reconstruct the entire city. All you need to do is put more effort into uh, trying to solve some of these problems on a limited basis. And we could discuss uh, if we get further in this process, hopefully we will, uh, there's certainly more that can be done in terms of the, where you have to reconstruct an entire street, but most streets don't have to be reconstructed. And I, I'll just say one more thing. When streets are milled, um, I understand when you're, you're, you're taking old asphalt out, you put the new asphalt in, sometimes the city and its contractors make things even worse. Um, it's not fair, it's not reasonable. I actually was thinking about doing a bill that would put a moratorium on all fines for people 
who have uh, water accumulated in their own property until the city gets its act together. No reason why someone should get a fine for something on their property, but the city doesn't take care of the streets. So I'm happy that we have this, uh, this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff for putting this on the agenda. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how this progresses. Thank you. I also thank you, and, and we will be working together. Uh, I will also recognize Councilmember Ross, who is here. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Vaca, too. That situation that Councilmember myself is, is addressing, Commissioner, is like something that is not only affecting a particular area. As he said, I can tell you that, yes, in front of my building, 100 Adams Street, yes, at that corner, that's, that's one of those corner with a little bit of rain, the water always stay there. I have brought to the attention of DOT in that situation. And recently, like two months ago, there was a repaving on that particular street. I even brought to the supervisor who was working that night, say, are you looking at this situation that in that particular corner, I have many photos, been taken for months in that particular location. Are you looking to do the repaving in a way that the water will not stay there, accumulated? The answer was yes. I walked by, repaving done, similar situation. So it looked at what the council member myself is bringing to the attention, and myself, you know, that had brought that attention to the agency that live across in the building, a residential building where I live, living in that situation. is dealing with that. You know, this is about water that turns into ice. Senior citizen crossing in that intersection. Children that they cross by and there's gonna be mosquito coming to that area because water stay there. And if that happening again in the location that I identify, I'm pretty sure that if we put in Twitter, asking New Yorkers, do you have any particular area sidewalk where the water stay there after the raining happened? We will hear a thousand of cases. So what are we doing? How much are we paying attention to that situation? Okay, thank you, council member. Um, first and foremost, I wanna say that we do take these ponding conditions very seriously. We investigate each and every one of them that do, we do receive. We wish, as um, council member Maisel um, mentioned, that they could be addressed more commonly with our in-house milling and paving operations. We estimate that only about 20% can actually be fixed or addressed by doing some milling and regrading. Um, in his case, he mentioned adding additional asphalt. Often they cannot be because in, in the process of doing so, you're gonna create another new situation. So you may not meet existing hardware on the street. Okay, that could be a catch basin, that could be a utility cover, it could be any number of objects on the street. Um, they're actually a lot more complex than sort of um, a typical person might understand when first looking at them. So in terms of, of your specific location, we're happy to look at that again. We do have, when we do um, mill and pave, we very carefully take measurements of the existing roadway. Um, we generally seek to meet that existing roadway. If we're aware of an issue, we also try to correct it. Um, but it's not as precise a science and easily correctable um, as it may appear. And I'd like to ask Galileo Orlando to um, add to my comments to kind of further elaborate on that. I thought that, you know, to be able to see a plan on how we are, you know, have something in place of how many area, in how many area, intersections or sidewalk we are dealing with this situation, what is the plan to bring into zero, you know, the area in the city that, you know, after a raining day, water stay there and it turn into ice during the winter time or it attract mosquito because it doesn't move from there. And I have a question and on, on related to the painting, the idea to paint, you know, the area close to the fire drive. How much uh, parking tickets were issued in 2016 for parking within 15 feet? of a fire hydrant. Um, one moment, we have that information. Okay, oh, thanks. Um, okay so NYPD um, issued 470,000 violations for parking at a hydrant 
in calendar year 2016. 470? 470,000. Yes. And if while we're at it, um, bus stop violations, which is also part of the bill, is 281,000. Uh, on the buses, how many? Uh, 281,000 in calendar year 2016. How much revenue did he generate? I don't have those figures with me. We'd have to get Can anyone for you think get that information? I'm not sure that we'll be able to get it during the hearing, but if not, we'll get it to you later. Okay. How will a driver know that this is for he or she to park? Right. So generally the rule of thumb that drivers use is that each sidewalk flag or square is five feet long. So generally the rule of thumb is that three sidewalk squares on either side of the hydrant encompass the 30-foot area in which you cannot park. Now, that being said, there can be sidewalks that are distinctive. They have different um, size um, sidewalk flags or some special material. So that rule, although it applies in the vast majority of cases, it does not apply in every case. Another rule of thumb drivers go by is the, um, the length of a car. About 15 feet um, is the length of a car. But what we find is that drivers do understand the 15 feet in the course of um, you know, getting your driver's license and learning distances between you and other cars, people develop this judgment um, in order to be able to comply with the 15-foot rule. Will that painting be considered the resource, the, the funding for if we decided to move this bill and paint that distance? Would that be capital expense? Um, I believe that would be expense. Expense. I think, I think that we are failing to working class New Yorkers. I think that this is not about safety, this is about revenue. Like, look, I, we are in the business to raise revenue, to be able that we, to run the daycare, to be able to provide all the services. But this is not a way of how we should do it. Like, I can tell you, I have a bill that is, will establish, will allow drivers to park after standing station truck, after park the, clean the street. And I had like 40 sponsors. I had no move that bill. I had no push on this bill, but not because I don't understand it, that this has been unfair. The rationale of why we are holding on that one. In this particular one, not at all. We cannot live in a city. I can tell you, the senior centers at 10th Avenue or 201st Street, working with DOT, and when you were in Manhattan, and MTA, we were able to bring a new M100 bus going in that direction. Mm -hmm. The bus stop being installed in that area in front of the senior center, the diamond houses, a lot of confusion on the, the how the distance for drivers to park. Dozens of dri drivers getting ticket because it is not clear the area for them to park. So that's not a way where we should be conducting business here. We should not, give me something, put a mark. Is it too expensive? Let's find a way of how, what is the, the mark that we should be there? But I'm pretty sure that if we did a survey and we ask New Yorkers, working class and middle class, should we live in a city that you don't know the distance and we come with the argument and we know that this is pure about raising revenue, this we should, we should, we should be able to work. We should be able to say, if it's not painting, what is, the, what is that we would do for drivers to know when, where they should be allowed to park when they are close to a bus stop, when they are close to a fire hydrant. With that, I would like to now call and recognize Council Member uh, Gentil and Garani, and now call on Council Member Gentil, who also has a bill to speak about too. But thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And you, I, I think you said most of it, uh, but let me indicate uh, that um, along with Councilmember David Greenfield, um, we have proposed Intro 623, which you've already spoken about, that requires the Department of Transportation to paint curbs adjacent to fire hydrants and bus stops. Um, and it really is, as I think uh, uh, Chairman uh, Rodriguez said is, a, is really a common sense piece of legislation that really addresses the everyday issues of New York City drivers that they experience. Targeting a motorist by traffic enforcement agents and police officers who tick in cars parked within 15 feet of fire hydrant is an everyday occurrence. Uh, unless 
um, they know the flags that you refer to or carry a tape measure. Uh, neither the driver nor law enforcement know what exactly 15 feet is because the curbs are not painted. Um, 15 feet to one person or a flag or two flags or three flags um, or flags that are irregular, um, arbitrarily enforced parking violations, and it's a guesstimate. It's a guesstimate. It's an unfair policy. And although DOT doesn't do enforcement in this area, you must recognize the situation that drivers are in. Uh, you cannot have a blind eye to the situation of what drivers face every single day. And just by the fact of the number of tickets that have been issued uh, is, a, is a realization that this is an everyday frustration for people and it is a revenue generator. This bill will alleviate the burden um, that uh, even uh, uh, fire, fire trucks or bus drivers have to deal with when a car obstructs their designated way. And people don't maliciously park there, um, but they're just unsure of what is exactly 15 feet. Um, if from, from a fire hydrant or 100 feet when it comes to uh, a bus stop. Um, the simple job of just painting the curb um, will not uh, really is, is the answer here. Um, for example, at the fire hydrant opposite to 152 Forsyth Street in Manhattan, 84 cars were f unfairly ticketed from August 15th through December 31st of 2014. That accumulated to over $9,600 or more than $25,000 a year in fines. Discrepancies in the law between drivers and law enforcement and what is legal parking spot is what's led to this frustrating uh, incident. So painting the curbs on fire hydrogens bus stops easily solves the problem, does not frustrate New Yorkers, and keeps the area clear. A gallon of red paint at a hardware store is $37. Despite thousands of hydrants and bus stops, as you testified to in New York City, I'm sure that in the DOT budget of $900 million in the operating budget or a $10.1 billion five-year capital uh, budget, uh, there's enough to pay for this simple yet effective uh, solution. You've done a lot with Vision Zero and traffic and pedestrian. This is not a Vision Zero. This is about parking, not about traveling. Uh, however, uh, there is zero vision on the city's part when it comes to this frustration that people uh, uh, face every single day near a fire hydrant or a uh, bus stop. So 623 is a common sense solution to this problem throughout the city. Um, municipal government in New York City is about setting national precedents, but it can't do it without addressing the everyday New Yorker issues. It's a simple, practical, feasible, common sense solution. Paint the curb, understand the problem, acknowledge the problem, paint the curb. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and thank you to DOT. I appreciate uh, your holding a hearing today on uh, this package of bills, particularly intro 955, which would raise the fines for companies that fail to repave and repair streets properly after they dig them up. Uh, big companies like Verizon, Con Ed, Time Warner often dig up our streets to lay wires, fix cables, and check on pipes. When they do, it is their responsibility to repair them according to standards and specifications set by the Department of Transportation. These standards exist to ensure that the safety of the public is protected. When companies fail to meet the standards, they must be held accountable. After all, uh, drivers, bikers, pedestrians, uh, can't send these big businesses the bill when they uh, are harmed by a, a divot or bump or crevice caused by their shoddy work. We need to send the message to these companies that cutting streets does not include cutting corners. Private use of public streets is a privilege, not a right, and it should be treated that way. If you tear up our streets and fail to repair them, you're going to pay the price. So I think it's time to raise the fines here that companies are already considering the cost of doing business especially since some of them haven't been raised since 1993, the year Metro cards were first tested. The bill doubles fines on certain violations, raising them from $5,000 to $10,000 for things like digging up a street without a permit, repaving a street improperly, or blocking a fire hydrant or a bus stop. Other fines would jump from $1,000 to $5,000 for improperly installing curbs, failing to remove debris, and similar violations. 
So uh, I want to thank DOT. I, I uh, heard the testimony, so thank you for your support, and also we'll be interested in, in uh, understanding from you all uh, if you believe the fines have been effective in a way uh, to ensure compliance with DOT's rules and whether additional suggestions that you may have uh, to ensure that people uh, who are digging up the streets or perhaps even digging up the streets without permission uh, could be better in compliance with doing so. So with that, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to say a few words, and I apologize that I was in a meeting that required that I be a couple minutes late today. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have bill. We have bill? Okay. Council. Uh, um, uh, okay. So now we get uh, my colleague, the colleague who is speaking, the Gentil, the first one, the opportunity to ask question. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief because I, I, I've said um, most of what I wanted to say. But um, uh, I, I assume you understand the problem that motorists face. Uh, am I correct? We, we understand the problem as you're presenting it, yes. Okay. Uh, when was the last time the Department of Transportation painted the curbs? Okay, it is actually illegal to paint curbs. Now, curbs have been painted in the past by DOT or someone in the city painted the curbs by bus stops and, uh, and, and hydrants. Right, so there are times that we're aware that local firehouses will go out and paint critical curbs around hydrants in their neighborhood. We are aware of that. So we know that sometimes the fire department does so, but DOT does not. So in years past when, when bus stops were, were painted yellow, um, you're saying that DOT did not paint those bus stops? Correct. Did not? Correct. Even though we it was done not. citywide, five boroughs? We have not painted curbs, correct. Ever? Ever? And I've been in DOT 20 plus years. I'm not aware of any time that we have ever painted okay. curbs. I, did you grow up in this city? Did you see painted curbs? Um, I, I'm not, it's not ringing a bell, to be honest, the painted uh, curbs that you're okay. mentioning. Um, um, I think my colleagues will remember painted curbs, right, around hydrants and, and bus stops. So uh, it, it is a fact of those who grew up in the city knowing that that's uh, the case. Um, now, you know, you prefer, you, you, you talk about doing, uh, preferring street markings uh, and, and signage on, on streets themselves. With, uh, with painted lanes, uh, painted arrows, um, so on and so forth. Um, uh, it seems to me that that is more expensive uh, than doing what we suggest in, paint, in requiring these uh, curbs to be painted because those streets and those street markings uh, tend to wear out tend to be torn up when the street is torn up, tend to be paved over when the street is paved over, and you're back doing that same marking over and over and over and over again, as opposed to a curb which normally is not going to be uh, torn up, is not going to be uh, run over. Um, it seems to me that uh, when you talk about cost here, you, you're doing a far, it's a far uh, higher cost to do the kind of street Pave, the street markings that you do in the pavement than on the curb. Okay, the markings that you're referring to are roadway markings that provide direction for both motorists, pedestrians, cyclists on um, safely navigating roadways. So those are safety markings that are necessary. And yes, they do require um, maintenance and refurbishment, but they're very critical. And, and we've seen in the last few years with Vision Zero, with an increase actually in guidance markings, um, great improvements in safety. So those markings are critical. We would not want to compromise them um, in any fashion where the markings that you're suggesting, um, you pointed out when, when you first spoke that um, it's pretty easy to get a gallon of paint. That's one of the critical things we're worried about here, that a homeowner who may find it very irritating that their neighbors park right up to their driveway and it's hard for them to get in and out, may take it upon themselves to get that gallon of paint paint some, paint three feet on either side of, of their driveway. It's the kind of so thing we for believe the safety, that will lend itself 
to um, a, abuse around the city. And cause well, so for the sake of those miscreant homeowners who might paint their curb illegally, you will not paint any curb throughout the five boroughs of the city of New York just because of those, well, those few number of homeowners that you think might be the miscreants and go out and paint their own curb, which you can find them for. Well, it's actually not just that reason. We also move bus stops probably more often than people may be aware. Um, for one reason or the other, it might be construction, the bus stop may be shifted on the roadway. We would have to figure out how to get off the old markings in order to remark. We have bluestone curbing that people are, are very protective of that we wouldn't want to mark up. Um, there are multiple reasons that we believe that is not the most, co most effective way to but it's not impossible to do. You, you make it sound as if it's impossible to change a marking, to remove a marking. It's not impossible to do. It's just a matter of, uh, of doing it. And, and the benefit in doing it is far greater than the obstacles and the bumps in the road, so to speak, that you bring up. Well, we believe there are better ways to designate. Better and ways. We would actually be, and I wanted to offer um, to the council member, you talked about um, your location. Um, you as well, if there's a way we can help get out better information to the public on the 15-foot rule. Count flags? As well. I, I want as senior well citizens to get out of the car and count flags? Well, it's, it's a glance. If you can see a sign from uh, as a driver, I think you can also see it's that. It's a guesstimate. We it's can also explain um, some better guidance on bus stops. We'd it's be a, happy to do that. If that it's a very happen. expensive guesstimate that need not be. We shouldn't be, as the chairman said, raising revenue based on guesstimates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, Commissioner, I think that this is one of those battles that, again, like a lot of years working together with you in the previous and the current administration, not that one thing is your role as a deputy commissioner, the other one is about, you know, your experience and, and, and you know, always trying to be accessible and working with the different communities. This is a battle that you will not win. The administration will not win this one. Like many times, this is what I do when I park my car. I go out, I got count the feet that I know that I can allow to park. And that's what many drivers, they doing every day. Yes, because we don't know the distance on how close we can park to a high drive. So this is not, again, like, what is a common sense? This is vision zero. This is about the good drivers. This is not about someone that because he or she has a placard, they park in front of the, or the fire drive. This is about someone who is looking to park in the area that we by law are allowed to park. And all we are saying is people should know the distance. Give something. Put a mark. Give something there more than saying we cannot do it. Like, you know, how much you will take it? Let's raise the money. They put the money. This is about raising revenue, Commissioner. This is not about anything else but more raising revenue. And again, we will be negotiating budget. We need that money for the school, for park, and for other things. We should be able to raise the money in other way, more than saying the bus stop. Go send someone today. 201st and 10th Avenue. That has been there for months. DOT, MTA, they know for months that when the new staff was there, there's not a clear area where people should know where they can park. High drive, the, high drive the people, they don't know. They have to come out from the car and count the feet so that they can avoid and respect the law. All we are saying is let's give the clarity because there's no clarity today. Good drivers, they don't know. Not the bad one who they use the authority to park a car in front of the hydrant. We talk about hardworking people that when they come out from work, they would like to find a way, can we park here? And there's not any area. Paint it or clear. This is how close you can park to the hydrant, and we need to change it. This is, this, is, this is what we should do as a city. Hey, Chairman, I'd just like to reiterate that this would be extremely burdensome for, for the city. We strongly disagree with this bill. It would cost millions of dollars to implement, and then millions going forward to keep it up. It would present a, a great new burden on, on the department. A lot, of bull, a lot of council members, they would be more than happy. I can tell you that if we can work the, the labor piece, 
and you ask community board, can you do a day painting? People will be more than happy to go out and paint it. Volunteer, a local small business, they will be down to put the money. If we can work with DOT, put like a team of people, volunteer to go out and paint it, I can tell you my community board, I will do it in one, in one week. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, ponding. Um, in my district, I know that you know we have a lot of ponding, especially where the curb cuts are. So I wanted to ask to see how closely this DOT and DEP work together to sort of resolve these issues. Because there are some streets where there's no catch basin, and the catch basin is around the corner, uh, so the, the water doesn't flow. And I know one incident in my district um, on Canal Street, there was like a huge ponding and DOT working with DEP and, uh, and the local um, business improvement district finally got that improved. So if you can talk about how to deal with that issue, um, especially on the curb cuts, then you have, you know, seniors have to navigate puddles of water that it could turn into ice in the winter and people with baby carriage and wheelchair, they all have to push through the water. And it seems like there's a lot of ponding right at the curb cuts. Um, as, as you know, ponding is, um, is a complicated situation that has many components. Usually uh, a challenge is balancing moving the water, but also meeting the, the edges of the curb cuts so we don't introduce trip hazards or other hazards uh, uh, and that's a challenge that, that we deal with every day. We do work closely with DEP, uh, and we do joint site inspections. Um, often ponding is addressed through a triaging, where if it's easy, it's just dealing with the asphalt, it will be. If it's not, we will do a joint inspection with DEP, and we'll look at what needs uh, um, need to be for each individual case. Um, but often it will involve um, some capital investment, and that takes time, effort, and, um, and funds. Uh, and that's why sometimes it seems like a long time. I believe the one on Canal Street was addressed when there was a construction of uh, resurfacing going on, if, if I recall, uh, on that one. It was finally addressed through a capital um, construction project. So the, the one that happens um, on the corner where the curb cuts are, I mean, do you have any plans in terms of how to deal with those situations? Because we have a lot of those in Lower Manhattan, especially down Water Street. Uh, again, we, we tend to look at them in a case-by-case because -case they are complicated um, um, individual assessments. Um, and we do work with our sister agency, DEP, to see what could be um, done through their capital program um, at whatever uh, those locations may need. But council member, if you, if you have those locations, please do give them to us and we will follow up with you on them. Yeah, because oftentimes it's, uh, it's manually you know, done by, if luckily we have a business improvement district and they'll send people down to push the water around the corner to the catch basin. But I think that we really need to look at long term. If you, know, you might have to add more catch basin next to it or some ways of pushing the water um, to where they could flow away instead of, because the curb cuts is supposed to be there to help people uh, cross the street and, and navigate the street, the people who really need extra help. And meanwhile, they're met by puddles and in the wintertime it turns into ice and it's very dangerous. So I hope that we can, you know, work together and really come up with, a, you know, a strategy of how to really fix this. Um, and also work together with uh, local organizations. I mean, downtown, we have downtown lines, and, but we need to work together with the city agency to really resolve this, this big issue. We look Thank forward to working together with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, how many ponding complaints did you receive last year? Standing water complaints go uh, first to uh, the Department of Health, um, okay. who then makes an assessment that if it's a, a DOT issue and refers it to us. So do you have the number of how many? Sorry, can you please identify yourself? 
I'm Galileo Orlando, Deputy Commissioner for Roadway Repair at New York City Department of Transportation. So can you go through how many complaints so, Department of Health? So last year, the Department of Health, I believe, received over 2,500 standing over water 2000. complaints, and um, roughly about 10 percent were determined to be DOT. Um, the rest of DEP, you're saying, is? The rest is, is I, I can't speak to the rest, because. Uh, oh. So hold on. So there are only two agencies who would address a ponding issue to a great degree, right? So, I mean, well, three. Let's go through DDC, DEP, DOT. I used to chair the Environmental Protection Committee, so I'm well aware of the, the procedure of how this is supposed to be addressed. So can you speak to, if you said 10 percent of these were found to be DOT, then we're, who is responsible for the other 90 percent? Just to interject, many of them can be on private property as well. Okay, so okay. can you disseminate information on how many were private versus public? Do we have so that we information? Don't, we don't have the whole breakdown from DOH. So I'd really currently, suggest we, we not use generalities because if you don't have that breakdown to say, so would you well, say we, half of these are private or do you have a number? Well, we, what we do know is that about 200 of them a year are referred to DOT. So we don't have a breakdown on, on the rest, but we can tell you that about so 200 out of a year 2, comes 2,000, you only ha know how much, that you only know generally we're 200 of them. Correct. Okay. So I, I guess that's why we have this bill, obviously, because there are definitely issues around us. I represent Southeast Queens, so this issue is an issue we live with uh, every day. Uh, are you familiar with the mayor's $1.7 billion commitment to Southeast Queens? Yes. And, and, and I, I'm interested in knowing how are your agencies coordinating together. So can you speak to how Department of Health, DEP, DDC, and DOT, how do you coordinate together? Do you meet monthly or do you meet yearly? So when we have a ponding condition, we go out and take a look. What we do is we go out within a few days of a rainfall. What's so a few days? 48 hours of a rainfall. So what we do is we don't go out three hours after the rain has stopped. We go out a little bit later to see if the rain has remained in Are you positive in you got in 48 hours? Excuse me? Are you positive you got in 48 hours? We do go out within 48 hours. So How many inspectors? Um, our, our crews, this is worked in with the, our milling and paving operation. So we have supervisors, we have workers that inspect all sorts of things prior to milling and paving. They inspect all kinds of asphalt and pothole conditions. So it's not a dedicated number of crews for bonding. Right. So how many so people within this segment of your, uh, your agency, how uh, many we, workers we, address these we have, specific issues? Um, things are interchangeable. So probably in each borough, there could be five or six people who, who survey different. Okay, do we have a number? Number. Um, they're not, again, they're not dedicated. That's why I can't give you a precise number. So they do different things every day. All right. So there's no specific division that just works on this issue, you're saying? Our roadway repair division included in their tasks is to look at ponding. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I find it hard to believe 48 hours that you get out there because we have locations that take months to get checked and for us to get information. Okay, well let me explain, let me explain mm -hmm. in, in better detail then. We don't see each and every one within the fir first 48 hours of a rainfall. But you just said you do. receiving that. When okay. we can inspect it, we can't ex inspect everything immediately. That's why this, uh, the 14 day period is not feasible. We get complaints. We schedule them for inspection, but it must be done in conjunction with when there is rain. Okay, so if you send me something on a Monday and it rains on a Tuesday, I may not get out there Thursday. I might need to wait a few more weeks or even 30 days until I have an inspector available to go look at that. Once we receive the ponding condition and look at it, we determine whether it's something we can address in-house through our milling and paving operation. We, we estimate, you know, something like 20% can be, can be addressed or improved or even, you know, fixed through our milling and paving operation. So Any, I'm gonna end my comments, but I, I don't see any real coordination going on amongst well, agencies. I, and I've been here 15 years, I've been elected four, and as someone who did constituent services, I can tell you it's been a, we have to beat the drum steadily, steadily to get your agencies out there to really address these issues. 
Um, and I'll also just point out, you know, a lot of times we get uh, you know, uh, a response from the agency that says, well, we have to look at larger capital issue, uh, larger capital projects, which I understand, but there needs to be more responsiveness in addressing some of the, um, you know, ponding issues that, that are not being addressed uh, for the short term. And I'm happy to say today there is a short term project happening in my district, so I'm very happy about it, but that we need to see more uh, action in this area. And I, I will just, Mr. Chairman, say I think this bill is good and, you know, and we're not seeing the response times within 48 hours or, or nevertheless not even, uh, furthermore, not even a month. So we need to see more activity and more coordination amongst the agencies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. I'd like to acknowledge that also we've been joined by Council Member Greenfield and Lansman. Uh, we have Council Member Menchak. Thank you, Chair. Intro 231, uh, your testimony spoke to the recently passed in, uh, local law 65, Matteo, Levine, and others that will begin online information. It's unclear from your testimony whether or not you support this particular bill. Can you, can you just tell us whether or not you support 231? So uh, presently, Parks Department has a, has a system that uh, will be coming online shortly where people will be able to track upcoming tree planting. Uh, and so one of the things that we feel, as, as well as Parks feels, that that can be addressed with what they have coming down the pike. Tell me how that will be addressed and the with the intentions of this bill. My name is Fiona Watt. I'm the senior advisor to the assistant commissioner for forestry, horticulture, and natural resources for the New York City Parks Department. You have a really cool job. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We're actually very excited about Local Law 65 because it gives us the opportunity to inform the public about the status of four of our really key programs, um, tree planting, block tree pruning, sidewalk repair around trees and stump removal. And uh, through Local Law 65 on October 23rd, we will be providing an online portal with all the information, both what we've done and what we plan to do, and that information will be updated quarterly. So uh, forgive me if I'm, I'm gonna pause you next. So, so I think we're all aware of that. We're really excited about that. This is a different piece of legislation. So 231 is asking for there to be a, a local law for direct information of anyone that's pulling permits for construction uh, within a season before to alert homeowners who are about to spend dollars on their sidewalk before they're gonna get a new tree. How does what you just said solve that problem? Because instead of having to go to another agency um, to find out the information, the public can actually find out the information at any time, whenever they want. So we're putting the onus on the public to do the research on, In which is fine, right? I mean, that's yeah, like, that's, search. it's like, well, we have, we have buckets of information. People should just go and find out whether or not they're gonna do it. I think what we're trying to do here, the spirit of this of legislation, which is why I want to have a conversation with you, is to is to alert folks that we know are going to have some kind of investment. These are our homeowners, middle class New Yorkers that are trying to do their job to repair their sidewalks, and they may or may not know about this law, and so this would trigger an automatic alert to the construction team that will be going out there. And so I, I guess I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out from you what, whether or not this would be that added step for full compliance to make a lot of homeowners happy right now, which is good, and allow for the tree to come in and then, and then bring in the repairs post. And we are very happy to discuss with DOT the logistics of how these um, requirements will interact. Since this law, I'm glad you're here, since this law or this local law was uh, introduced, um, we've had some conversations with some homeowners, and it brought up another, it might be another LS request later, but uh, there were times where trees were planted in the wrong place, right next to another tree, for example. There's this gross example that I want to talk to you about on 17th Street between 4th and 5th Avenue, 
on the south side, and nothing was kind of done. So I want to talk to you about, so there's, there's, there's connection that can happen with the tree implementation piece and the homeowner to ensure that everyone's kind of happy and that, that the work happens. Uh, I'll follow up with you right after, after this. Um, so again, it just sounds like we don't want to do the extra step. You're not support of this, and and uh, we'll just keep keep moving on that. Council and member, maybe just to clarify very quickly, what we know at DOT we can do is include a stipulation in everybody's permit suggesting that they go to this website at the Parks Department to see if there is any work coming up at the same site. We know we can do that. If it was going to go a step further with us identifying, sort of linking Park's website to applicants to figure out in, in front of any specific property, if there's sort of a match, I understand. And because that's I have the difficulty that we would need to really look from an IT perspective on whether or not we can make that happen. What's the resistance? Is it just staff time? Um, it's Is not it resistance. Funding? It's, like a technical, it's really a technical or technology issue that we would, it's need, a technology that issue. We would need to explore further. So we know we can, we can put the stipulation in and encourage people to go to the park's website. Um, but taking it a step further is, is going to be a challenge. Okay, let's keep talking about that because sure. it, I'm not convinced that it's a big enough issue to not move forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, Rose? Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I'm going to have to join the, um, the crowd and beat this dead horse about um, ponding. You know, um, you addressed the fact that ponding um, is an issue that often constitutes the, I guess the remedy to it constitutes a capital project and um, collaboration with other city agencies. But I didn't hear you address the fact that um, in many situations, ponding has been created as a result of um, inappropriate or or not incorrect uh, repaving. I, I have several situations in my district where a ponding um, situation didn't exist prior to the repaving. And, um, and I, I don't understand why something like that can't be remediated. Um, and I wanted to know, um, how do you determine uh, what the criteria is or, or what requirement has to be met in order to correct the situation like that? And there has to be some sort of low-term, low-cost solution for DOT and the other agencies you know, that could implement and imp improve drainage on the streets that are experiencing ponding. Um, so first I would like to thank you for coming by this morning to support our lower level boarding initiative. We really appreciate your presence. You're welcome. Um, and then I'll sort of address and the I first. I want to say thank you. It's about time and, and the, my constituents really appreciate that. Excellent. I'm so glad. Um, I'd like to ask Galileo to talk a little bit more about the technical aspects, the second part of your question, but the first question that you had where you saw resurfacing um, that actually created issues that hadn't right. been there or maybe hadn't been there as badly before. If, if you can provide us with any of those locations, we definitely want to look into it. Um, that can happen once in a while. It um, mm -hmm. doesn't happen very often, but it's something we would certainly want to address and follow up with you. But in terms of technically mm -hmm. how we can um, ensure we're, we're meeting the right grade, um, Galileo. And, and I just want to add, um, uh, before you start, Galileo, that um, you've heard many of my colleagues talk about there are just some, some corners that are really important, and despite the, the, the cost, should be addressed. And they are corners where there are school children that have to cross and, and seniors. So could you address sure, how sure. you would do that? Sure. Well, sometimes um, after resurfacing, the water moves for a better, and it will actually collect somewhere instead of being spread out when the road is deteriorated. And sometimes you'll see more uh, collection of water. Um, part of that is the intent, but also you, it, it shouldn't be just collecting and informing. But you will see this aggregation of water in some cases. Um, in other cases, again, it's a balance between meeting um, all the curb cuts, the driveways, the ped ramps, um, and making those, striking that balance between 
those elevations and moving the water. And it is a delicate balance act. But previously, that was not an issue. And so you're saying that well, the repaving um, process is to sort of um, no longer spread it out, but to have it collect in, in mass no. at one No. Well, previously, location? there may have been some other issues about you know having a little bit of a lip or a trip hazard at a ped ramp, at a driveway apron, uh, or some of those crossings. So sometimes it's a delicate balance. But we address ponding normally through a triage. And certainly, and certainly the last case is sometimes things doesn't come out perfect. In those cases, they could be quickly remedied. And um, I believe we do come out after um, um, a resurfacing where we get any complaint. If there's a quick fix, we certainly will take it. We, we are not going to try to uh, um, not try to take the opportunity you would for that ready fix. Well, we would, repave. we would repave, we would adjust the grade, whatever we could do, we will do. Um, but often it's not the quick fix that's, that's that simple. Often it's a system of different components, and, and that's when we have to partner with our sister agencies and start looking at the more comprehensive. Certainly when water is collecting at the corner, we have to figure out how to get rid of that water. And, and the grading, so it, it's about grading. And when you repave, you're, um, are you building that level up so that now it, it creates a situation where it, it formerly did not? Because now we're, it's not only graded differently, but we have a higher level, in, and, in, and the in, curb in, actually in some cases, plays into that? In some cases, but if the water is collecting at the corner, the next question is, getting rid of that water, actually draining that water. The, the roadway is designed to collect water at, at corners, to bring it down to the end of the street, and to um, drain it. And that's where we work collaboratively with, with DEP to try to see how we could actually drain that water after it's collected. My time so is up, but I'm going to talk to you afterwards. Sure, sure. Thank you. Councilman Garani. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you um, for your support of 955. I should probably leave well enough alone, but I have a couple of follow-up questions, if you don't mind. Um, first is, there are people who uh, have permission to dig up city streets to do repairs all the time. It happens every single day of the year. Um, what is their obligation in terms of condition uh, to which it must be restored at the end? Is it restore it roughly to the condition which it is in today? Is it restore it to the condition which it is supposed to be under the city's optimal standards? What is the standard in which they're supposed to res restore the street after the work is done? Uh, after someone uh, excavates, repairs the infrastructure that has needs to be repaired, they're responsible for restoring the roadway to its previous condition. And obviously, that cut separates it from the rest of the roadway, but the whole purpose for the restoration is that they restore it in kind to its previous condition as best they can. Uh, and does that include uh, all, any paintings, markings, um, and anything else that DOT might have already put into the road? Yes, it does. Uh, and. How many fines are issued annually for failure to repave or repair streets uh, after work is being done? I don't have that specific information in front of me. Okay, how about the information about fines for those who open the streets without a permit from DOT? Do you have those numbers? Hold on a second. Maybe, and while Leon's looking for that, if I can mention one other thing we did last year. Um, we made more stringent requirements for street repair by utilities, contractors, and others. So what we did, um, we had three items that we moved forward. Um, one is a concrete base restoration where previously we would have people um, open the street and, and rather than replace the concrete, um, the sub base we call it, with concrete they could use asphalt. We're no longer allowing that because it's a lesser product, obviously, and it holds up, um, doesn't hold up as long. So now people are required for uh, concrete base restoration. We also now have all straight cuts. Where previously, 
At times you would see street cuts perhaps in odd shapes at odd angles. Um, we no longer allow that because where those angles meet, you're more likely to have deterioration of the roadway. So now we have all straight angles. And the last thing we did um, is larger cutbacks where we now have people actually open and then close and restore a larger area in order to um, minimize the smaller cuts that are more prone to deterioration. Uh, do the, does the existing fine schedule uh, address the new rules that you put in place about concrete base restoration and straight cuts and size of excavation? Yes. So those would fall. So if somebody does not do a straight cut, there's already a provision that would allow DOT to fine for lack of uh, compliance with that? Yes. Okay. Did you find the right. answer? No, I, I can't find it specifically. Okay. Will you come back to us on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, on, on the point about <clears throat> DOT feeling like you're hitting the mark on the proper level of fines today. From what I understand your testimony uh, is that you are appreciate, uh, you appreciate the possibility of having a higher fine, although you don't intend to uh, use it necessarily, because you believe that today you are hitting the mark on what the proper level of fines should be for people who either work without a permit or do shoddy workmanship. Is that, is that a fair, that's my understanding of your, your testimony, is that a fair that, character? That's fair, and, and what we want to do prior to evaluating any changes in fines is sort of, you know, t talk to our stakeholders. We want, to, we want to be very careful. We want to make sure the fine is not so high that there's an incentive to just go and try to do the work um, without a permit so people aren't on our radar. It's sort of a delicate balance that we really want to be very thoughtful as we go ahead and change fines. Yep. Right, okay, without knowing how many fines DOT issues in a year, which at this moment, okay, without this information, it. could be, maybe it's being gleaned, but uh, could be, a, a, you know, it could be very few or it could be a lot, as far as I can tell. Um, it's hard for us to assess whether or not mm -hmm. DOT is, is hitting uh, the right mark. We are going to give you permission to go higher, but I, I can't say that as I sit here, I have a better understanding as to whether DOC, DOT is fining sufficiently for shoddy work or whether you're actually catching people in the act of not Good. doing it. So I think work. we have some numbers for you. Great. So we're, what we have are the, the, the top uh, permits that we've issued uh, for work that's done. So the, the top, the top uh, fine that we issue out is for failure to permanently restore cut within the required time. So it's more of a time thing and that's the, the most we issue summonses for. Uh, the next one is open. How, how many? How many? That's uh, 6,450 uh, summonses for that category. In a year? In the, oh. in the last fiscal year. And then the next one is uh, we issued 4,270 summonses for opening a street without a permit. And then the next one is failure to comply with the terms and condition of DOT permits, and that's failure to, to comply with our stipulations. That's 4,207 uh, summonses issued. So those are the top three that we issue. Okay, and then just the, I'm, I'm out of time, but the last question that I would have for you all is the profile of the, the, the entities that are most likely to be not complying in time and the ones that are most likely to be working without a permit. Who are we talking about here? I mean, I know you noted uh, that there were utilities, other contractors, et cetera, et cetera. Who are the prime violators here? So specifically parsing out those specific ones, I can't tell you from here, but the majority of our, our summonses go to the utility companies. Uh, that's where the majority of our summonses go to. And I don't have that parsed out in these, in these details in front of me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilmember Landsman, and as a sponsor also of one of the bill, you can have additional time to also. Great, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, 1457, my bill, which would require uh, DOT to, um, uh, when it does a resurfacing, to uh, do whatever work is necessary on the curb to maintain the, the, the curb height. Um, and I don't fully understand or Maybe I understand, I just don't accept the administration's opposition to the bill. We have curbs for a reason, right? A part to prevent water in the street from coming onto people's properties and whatever other reasons there are that we have curbs. We've got them. 
So if DOT does a resurfacing of the street, and as a result, the curb either doesn't exist anymore because now the, 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 the street resurfacing that you've done is level with the curb or, or the curb height is, is reduced to the point that it's not accomplishing whatever it is a curb is supposed to accomplish, I don't understand how um, you could take the position that the thing that you've done, which has caused a problem, shouldn't be solved by you. And, and in your testimony, which I, I missed your reading of it, but I, I hear it's here in writing, to the effect that if you had to do this work, it would slow down your resurfacing throughout the city, I, I don't think that that's a, a tenable position. I think that my bill simply says, if you, if you cause a problem, you should fix the problem, which is eminently reasonable. What am I missing? So let me start by saying, and Galileo can um, help me out here. Every time we mill and pave, we, we do the right thing, okay? We won't simply add inches of asphalt to a road without taking it down by milling. So we will never come along and just raise the height of a road to an incorrect height, okay, and walk away. Incorrect vis-a-vis -vis the, the curb. Exactly. So we won't have too little curb reveal because of our milling and paving operation. We will always mill, and we and pretty much need to in, in every case now. Um, years ago, we were able to just sort of add asphalt to the roadways. They got too high, and now we mill every time we pave. So we will always do that, and that's the right thing to do, and you're totally correct in requesting that. Where it becomes more complicated is when we have a curb or a sidewalk problem. So curbs may sink, sidewalks may be in disrepair, which is the homeowner's responsibility. So when we go out there to, to mill and pave, for us to try to address a concrete condition, which is not, it's a totally different operation. Much of it is done by contract. Much of it is done by homeowners. Um, you know, it's sort of mixing two things that we can't address together on the spot. Well, I want to understand something because I have this in my district. I, I didn't just make this up. Where um, there was a street repaving in Jamaica Estates, happened to be, but it's in other places. And after the repaving and whatever milling you do and all of that, the distance or the height of the curb relative to the street was was much less to the point of it almost not even being a curb for all practical purposes than beforehand. So maybe that is an example, although there are others, where your stated process or procedure where, where you would not leave a curb smaller than it was before you started, right. broke down. But, but I don't even understand, like, in what scenario, because you're saying there's a, there's, there's, there are scenarios where even after you repave and remill mill and do all that you're going to do, the curb is going to, in relationship to the roadway, road surface, is going to be, be smaller than it was before you did the work. So, so two what, things, are those, that, what are those circumstances? Yeah, is that road, um, Eton Street, I don't know if I'm saying it right? Yeah, I think that sounds okay. about right. So we looked into that very carefully because we knew you were concerned about that location. That, that's a tricky location in that the curb there is a non-standard curb. Um, there, uh, there's cobblestone that was decorative cobblestone that was placed um, in place of a curb that would go down 18 inches. So it's very easy to think that over time that curb may have shifted or moved. Um, we, we looked, prior to this hearing, we looked very carefully at the before and after pictures and we, we think the resurfacing was done correctly. Um, and we're happy to talk with you more about that and meet, meet with the property owner or whatever um, you would like. But I think due to that non-standard curb, we, we don't have a tight curb um, street scenario going on there. Um, the second part of your question, the conditions that might not be able to be met, if, if you're talking about um, changing the height of the roadway to, to a great degree, you might introduce new problems. So if you, if you have to mill down, I'm making it up five inches, all of a sudden you're going to have utility covers that are going to be sticking up. You might choose to ramp them, but you're going to have a very poor quality street. 
you might not be able to get um, water to a catch basin. So really dramatic changes of roadway um, depths during paving will lead to other problems. So, so let's look at both of those. In, in the second scenario, where if you had to mill down, is that the right term? Mill? Yes. Okay. If you had to mill down enough to maintain the street height, that the curb height, it would cause other problems. Somebody has to deal with and pay for the fixing that curb or raising that curb so that it's a real curb. And if it's, it's either going to be the city, it's going to be DOT, that's going to have to raise that curb because it, it can't lower the, the surface anymore because of these other issues, or it's going to be the homeowner who's got to deal with that and, or, or suffer the consequences of having a, a non-existent curb. So if the city is doing the repaving and, and, and causing the problem, you know, for a well-intended purpose, we want our streets repaved, if the city is the one that's causing the problem where the curb is, is too low relative to the, to the, to the street surface, it, it seems to me obvious that the city should be the one to, to adjust the curb height. And, you know, whatever that means in terms of expense or, or delay and, you know, the number of miles you can repave in a year, you just have to do what you have to do. If you cause a problem, you, you have to fix the problem. Right. I think we would strongly state that we don't believe we're causing a problem through milling and paving. We're generally putting the roadway back the way it was. And it may not be a perfect roadway, but we're not exacerbating the problem. And, and addressing some of these bigger issues would really require a greater project. And once we involve homeowners, homeowners are responsible by law for maintaining their sidewalks, as you know, then it sort of sucks them into the problem in terms of cost and everything else and kind of becomes a much more complicated endeavor. But could we, could, we, could we agree that if the DOT is creating a problem by performing a project that results in a, a, a curb that is no longer really a curb, that it should be DOT and not the homeowner who should have to, to fix that and deal with that? So, so to, just to reiterate, you know, our intention is to sort of um, recreate what's already existing there. By, by going in and, and adjusting the curb could have a domino effect where the sidewalk now needs to be lifted. And that could also now impact on the property owner in terms of their stoop, their steps, their driveway, and it has this unintended domino effect. And but sure, they, but the, the homeowner the has to, could, right, I get it, but the homeowner re- has to deal with that regardless. Like, if they're there with, with, with a curb that, it is, that ain't a curb anymore, all those things have to get dealt with anybody. So who's gonna, who's the one who's gonna have to eat that? It should be the city's, the one that, that's done the resurfacing. If, if the situation arises where it's so severe, then it has to be addressed. But to go back to your initial comment about um, how, you, how it may not, you, to fully understand the impact on the resurfacing program, is that ultimately if this domino effect extends out and, and curbs and all sidewalks now have to be done on all resurfacing projects. It ultimately really hinders uh, um, the pace of uh, the resurfacing program. Right, and what I'm telling you from one council member's perspective is I am willing to accept, in my district at least, a slower pace of resurfacing if that does not result in X number of homeowners having this terrible headache that they now have to deal with, both in terms of time and their own resources. Can I, can I just ask one question, and, and um, this is of particular interest to a colleague of mine, a council member, Danique Miller. What is DOT's responsibility as it relates to missing or inadequate curbs generally, particularly in, in southeast Queens that um, causes ponding? Okay, the city is responsible for curbs, installing curbs, and it really relates greatly to the profile of the street. Parts of Queens where we don't have curbs, we generally have streets completely not built to city standards that need to be reconstructed and need to be rebuilt in, in, in entirely. Any plan for that? We, we have plans for that. There's a lot more work than um, we're going to be able to address in a, in a quick fashion, but yes. Yeah. All right. Well, Council Member Miller in particular might want to follow up with you on that. Okay. But thank you very much. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. 
Chaka, do you have any additional question? Again, <clears throat> I would like for you to take it back to your team, <clears throat> the mayor and the rest of the DOT uh, team that you work with that are gonna be strongly working on the intro 623. Uh, as I said before, in this bill that we require DOT to paint curbs in red in all bus stops and the distance on either side of a fire hydrant from which parking and standing or stopping is prohibited, uh, which is a 15 feet. This is something, it's a common sense. This is about vision zero. This is about allowing good drivers to know the distance that they should use to park a car in those particular area. And I would like to have conversation with DOT to see if we can do some pilot project, especially through some a community board that I know there's a lot of people very interested to be part of this partnership. This for me is about revenue, this is about safety, and I think it is time for us to, you know, update this legis legislation or this policy that we have in place, that they are not for anything more on those hundreds of thousands of tickets that we give, that at the end of the day benefit me too as a council member, because it is with that money that I also will balance the budget, but I wanted to say that and hoping that we will continue conversation not only with this bill, but with other bills that are important for all of us. With that, this hearing is adjourned.